I love those guys. Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. So what about you? Do you live your life in the radical love of our Lord? That's the question we're going to look at today in the next few minutes. As we kind of take as our theme verse um, out of 1 John 4, it says, And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son a propitiation for our sins. And he finishes it up. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So you can figure out that the theme for today, the theme for the week that you're going to be reading about as you go through the daily readings on the back of your connecting points, that are going to fill in a lot of the gaps of um, this topic today because you could spend weeks talking about God's love for us. Um, like few seasons that we're in, I would just really encourage you um, to get one of these connecting points and to go through these daily readings. Um, most of them will not come from the message today, but will be connected to it, obviously. Um, but it will help fill in and round out this idea of what God's love is for us and, and how we can live radically in the love of God. Um, but with that, let's open up our Bibles to the passage we're going to be in almost the entire time, and that's 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John is easy to find. It's almost at the very end of your New Testament. So if you go to the very end of your Bible and start working your way back to the left, you're going to go past Revelation, past this short little book of Jude, and you have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So it's right at the very end of your Bible. We're going to be in 1st John chapter 3. And unlike last week where I, we were kind of all over the Bible, um, we're going to spend almost our entire time in this passage. So you'll be able to um, sort of camp out here um, even as we look at um, other aspects of it. And we're going to look at three things that I see in this chapter. And the first one is, what love did for you? What did God's love do for you? So we're going to start right in verse 1 of 1 John 3. Everybody there? Awesome. Okay, so here we go. Starting in verse 1, it says this. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. Guys, I'm going to stop right there for a second because that word bestowed there is so powerful. It's so powerful because it's in the, what's in the Greek. It's called the perfect tense. That is a rarely used tense in the, Greek, in, the, in the Greek New Testament, but it is probably the most powerful one because what it conveys is it's completely of God and it's an action that was completed once for all time. So when he says here, so great a love the Father has bestowed on us, he's saying God has poured into us as believers in Jesus Christ this, this amazing love and it can be, never be taken away. People that believe that we earn our salvation or that we can lose our salvation don't understand the beauty of that word. Right? We didn't do anything to earn it. We, can't, we don't do anything to keep it because He has bestowed it on us. Perfect tense. It means a past completed action with ongoing future results that go on for eternity. He loves us completely. He loves us eternally. He loves us sacrificially. All of that is in that one little word. And, I, and you can't just go past that. And, that. and that isn't the only place in Scripture where that truth is seen. We see it over and over. But it's Him doing it, and He did it. And if you know Him, and you know that love, because that is a gift, and it's a gift like none other for all kinds of reasons, but one of them is it can never be taken from us. No matter how much I sin, no matter how much sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm separated from God, the truth is I'm not. Because I feel that way doesn't matter. The truth is, I'm not, because that word right there tells me he put, it, he put His love on me and it will never be taken away. Praise the Lord. It says, For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are, present tense, now we are, if you're His, you are this, children of God. It, is, it, is not, it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see him just as he is. Guys, what amazing promises, even the, just those few verses. We are his children. Present tense, we are his. We have been adopted into his family. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says it this way. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Guys, that's a promise to hold on to. We have been adopted into not just a family, but the family, right? And we are heirs of everything that is Christ's, and we will be like him. I don't, that just blows me away. In Philippians 3, Paul kind of 
um, expands on the point a little bit. In Philippians 3, verse 20, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. His second advent is what he's talking about, his coming back who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory for the ex by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Guys, we are heirs of, of things that we kind of, anything beyond all we could ask or think. That is what God has in store for us. So we are his children, we are heirs, we're adopted into his family. Let's look at verse 3. It says, And everyone who has, hope, has, his, has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. We know that he, that he appeared in order to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared, his first advent, he's talking about Christmas, for, his, for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. I'll come back to that in a minute. No one who is born of God practices sin because he, his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Guys, I'm going to stop for a minute and, and point out a couple of things in this passage, just fairly quickly. First of all, in the second half of verse 8, when he says that the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil, he's talking about God's redeeming grace in our lives. He is, he is talking about this idea that we're going to look at when we, in um, Lord willing, in 2016, the plan. We're going to we're going to be going through a, um, a series through the entire year called Redeeming Grace, and we're going to start on the first Sunday in January in Genesis one, and we are by the grace of God and in His power going to walk through the entire Bible in 2016, looking at the story God has been telling from the beginning, which is that He He, he came, the story He sent His Son Jesus Christ to redeem us back, to ransom us back from what this, the enemy, Satan, stole in the garden. And that is the story he starts with right in Genesis chapter 3 and tells through the remainder of the Bible. So I would really encourage you, if you don't know the interconnectedness of God's story that he tells in this book and, and how it's one theme, and that is salvation through Jesus Christ, um, you have something in store for you in 2016 because that's what we will be doing as a church body next year, Lord willing. So one, he came to destroy the work of the devil and he's done that on the cross. The second thing I see, and this can get confusing and we're not going to take a lot of time with it, is but I, as I look at that and I see, I see what John is saying in this passage and I go, he, it sounds like what he's saying is, if you're a Christian, you don't sin because anyone who is sinning is not righteous is of the devil. You go, wait a minute, I know me. Well, I'll just speak for me. I can't speak for you. I'm sure you guys don't sin, but I know me. I'm a sinner. And so I look at that and I start going, oh no, but where does that leave me? You know where that leaves me? That leaves me completely redeemed and forgiven by the grace of God. That leaves me victorious at the cross of Christ. What he's talking about here isn't our... There's a word that he uses multiple times in this passage that I just read. Practice. He's talking about practicing sin or practicing righteousness. He's talking about this idea that, that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5. Right? He talks about in Galatians 5, 16 through 19. He talks about the deeds of the flesh are evident. They are. And he lists all these things. That some of which I'm guilty of on a daily basis. Because I still have this flesh. But then he goes on at the end of that, of that chapter and he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things there is no law. Right? In, in Romans, remember in Romans chapter 7, Paul, he, he's, he's going through this whole thing about the grace of God, and he gets to the end of it, and he goes, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? What is he saying? He's saying, here I am. I'm, I am the one who God has chosen to author what God's grace looks like. In Romans, and yet... I'm sitting here living and I, I still can't get complete victory. I still sin. Why? He's like, because I still have this fallen flesh that's part of the fall. 
But then how does he answer his own question, oh, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? The, the point that John is making is the same point Paul was making. We, str we still struggle with sin, but we are sanctified. There's two ways to look at sanctification. One is positionally. Positionally, we are, back to that word at the beginning of this passage, bestowed, we are sanctified. We are set apart. We have been positionally sanctified. He sees us as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. He sees us as perfect. Why? Because of what his son did on the cross. But we are also progressively being sanctified. That's, my, that's where I'm at. I am constantly in this but my, my spiritual journey is sort of like, it's, I wish it was like this, you know, but it's more like, I, you know, I do okay for a while, and then bam, I, st I stumble. And then I do okay, and then I start, you know, I p get, by the grace of God and the power of His Spirit, I pick myself up, and I, we start walking this thing out again. And j hopefully, prayerfully, the general trend in my spiritual maturity is upward, right? But it's not perfect, because we are being progressively sanctified. And that's ultimately what this passage is talking about. Guys, Here's how I've experienced this in my own life. I, I did not become a believer until I was in my 20s. I remember who I was. Before I, I, my you know, flesh has a memory. Right? Many of you that became believers later in life, and, and even those that, that have been believers, even you young people maybe that grew up, that were blessed to be um, in a Christian home your whole life, and that is a blessing. Don't go, oh, I wish I had this awesome testimony. Guys, praise the Lord. Like, if you've been raised by parents who are teaching you to walk with Jesus Christ, you, you cannot possibly thank them enough. I was not raised in that kind of home. I know my parents did the best they could, but they still don't know Jesus Christ. And my flesh has a memory. And, and young people, I'll speak to you right now. Some of you are getting involved in relationships with other people and dating and, and even se just un, unbiblical physical relationships and I'm keeping it family friendly and I'm telling you guys, don't. It will forever impact the rest of your life. I know God has forgiven me of that. I know Jesus Christ paid the price for all that stuff and yet I also know that it still impacts my relationship with my wife. It impacts my ability to raise my daughters. Why? Because this flesh has a memory. And, and, and yet, here's what I know. Here's the good news. When I came to faith in Christ, when I was in my 20s, I didn't immediately just go, I don't sin anymore. Right? I, I, still, have a str I still struggle with that. I just talked about that. But here's what I started to feel for the first time in my life. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's the difference. The difference is, not that I don't sin anymore, the difference is that when I do fall, I immediately feel this, this conviction from the Holy Spirit. Not condemnation, that's from the enemy. I still feel that too. But conviction. Just this little, Doug, come on, man. You know better. Doug, come on. I'm inside you. Do not, don't, you don't live like that. That's the old self. Get back into living in the new self. Okay, so the one place I'm going to have you turn, and it's worth taking the time to go there, turn to Romans chapter 5. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Keep your finger in 1 John because we're going to be there for the rest of the time. But uh, we have to take the time to look at this. Romans chapter 5. And it's so cool because I, I, don't, I doubt he even knew I was going to talk about this today. But pa um, pa oh, so look at that. Pastor Dan. Elder Dan. There you go. That was for you, Deb. Elder Dan um, actually prayed this during our prayer time before the service. Um, so whether he knew it was coming or not, I don't know. But in Romans chapter 5, God used that to confirm to me that we need to take the time to, um, to talk about this. We need to remember the truth of God's grace that Paul talks about here. I'm going to start in verse 1. He says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our faith in Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained an introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. Guys, uh, you know, I, could just, I should just say amen and we should just go eat. Like, seriously. Like, that's the, that is one of the best sentences in all of Scripture. Right? We have, been, we have been allowed introduction to the throne of grace and we stand in the grace of God because of what Jesus Christ did. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, like as if that is not enough, 
but we also exult in our tribulations. Here's Jody Tootin's favorite verse. Knowing that tribulation brings out perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. For while we were still helpless at the right time, his first advent, we talked about that in the first week of the series, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone might even die. But God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Guys, he does not wait for you to clean up. He isn't waiting for you to get right before you come to church. He isn't waiting for you to get right before you come to him. Praise God, because I wouldn't have got, I, I'm still not right apart from him. Right? He's saying that while Doug was was wallowing in the filth that I was in, he just went, you know what? I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to pull you out of that and I'm going to set you on the rock of my son and you're going to walk this out and I'm going to walk with you. And that is another promise we ought to hold on to. Now get this, and we'll finish up with these last couple verses. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. That's that, that's that positional sanctification I was talking about a minute ago. We are justified. He sees us just as if I'd never sinned. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall now be saved by his life. And not only this... But we also exult in, the, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So here's our, the, point, the point we're making. What did the love of God do for you? It reconciled us back to him. It paid the price demanded that the enemy, when he stole us away, and he said, now they're mine, unless you pay me for them. God said, I got this. I'll send my son, and he will pay the bill. All of it. That's what his love did for us. That's what, in our theme verse for the day, 1 John 4, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved up, loved us and sent his son a propitiation for our sins. That's what that means. Propitiation means payment for our sins. And if God loved us that much, how much more should we love each other? So let's go back to 1 John 3 and look at our second point. What does love do to you? What does love do to you? So we're going back to 1 John. So what does love, the love of God, do to you? Starting in verse 11. For this is the message which we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And then he gives an example out of the Old Testament, right at the beginning. We'll look at this next year. Not as Cain, this was not love for each other, not as Cain, who was of the evil one, slew his brother, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and we know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's good deeds and sees his the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. So what does God's love do to you? It changes our heart. It changes our heart towards God, and it changes our heart towards other people. You know, we're in the Christmas season. It's not a Christian movie, but um, the um, what's the movie with Scrooge in it? Christmas Carol, right? Christmas Carol. Picture, have you, have you seen, who's seen the Christmas Carol, the movie Christmas Carol? I, I, we watch it every Christmas. It's not bad, just because it's not like overtly Christian doesn't make it horrible, right? So it's, it's okay. It's a, watch it. Watch, next time you watch that movie, picture Scrooge as he starts out, this old, bitter, hard man. Doesn't like anybody, doesn't, doesn't even like himself very much, I don't think. Picture him, but picture his heart as this big, dark, black lump of cold coal. Right? Just, just cold as ice, because that's what he is. And then at the end of the movie, after all this stuff happens, right? 
that heart comes alive. Now, not in a Christian sense, not in a spiritual sense even, but picture that same, if for us, the, the, uh, the analogy for us would be, prior to Christ, I am spiritually dead. I have, uh, my heart, prior to that time, was this cold, dark lump of coal. And yet, when He saved me and He comes and lives in me, it's like taking that lump of coal and putting it in a fire and, and getting it hot until it glows. That's what, he, that's what John is describing here. He's saying, guys, if, when, when he talks about, when he says in, in verse 14, when he says, um, because we love the brother, that, by this we know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren, and he who does not love abides in death. Here's what he's talking about. If your heart has really, if what, what God's love does to me, does to you, is if your heart has been changed by God, you cannot possibly live in this bitter, hard-hearted, cold-hearted way. And if you are living that way, what he's saying here is, you probably need to check your heart. Because you're probably not saved. And I'm not saying that. John's saying that. So take it up with him. Jesus put a lot of emphasis on love. And he put a lot of emphasis on love's effect. There's some verses that are going to come up on the screen. Look at this out of Matthew 22. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophet. You may have heard of this as being called the great suggestion. <laughs> hey, you're laughing. Why? Because it's not. What's it called? The great commandment. He is not, Jesus isn't suggesting that we love God and love people. He's commanding that we do it. That's why they call it the great commandment. He tells us in 1 John 14, he tells us that if, that if you love me, you'll, this is how, you'll love me, it'll, you'll show it by obeying me. And then in 1 John, or sorry, in John 13, he says it this way, by this all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. So he's describing not just this command to love, but he's saying, and here's what it looks like. When I change your heart, and your heart is no longer this lump of coal, but is a flame with righteousness and a flame with my glory, you will show that by your love for each other. You remember when we looked at this a few weeks ago, the scene after his resurrection, but before his ascension, and he looks at Peter and he says to Peter three different times, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, I know, you know I love you. Then he says, so bow down and kiss my ring. Does he say that? No. What's he say? Do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. He, Jesus immediately points, this love that you have for me should go out to other people. He makes that connection to him three times. In your, hand, in your bulletin today, we have some extras. There was a handout each week. We're having one of these. It's on love. On the front side, we'll get to the back side in a little bit um, before we go to communion. But on the front side of this little handout, there's, there's a passage. It's, it's sort of the 1 Corinthians passage on steroids. I just took all the different versions of the 1 Corinthians passage and put, them, um, put the words in there that are translated differently um, in different translations on there along with some other verses like Romans 12.10 which talks about preferring your brother. Guys, love is not a suggestion. Brotherly love is not a suggestion. It is a command. It's part of why we do a fellowship meal every Sunday. It's why we're doing one today. It's because it's a great opportunity for us to practice brotherly love. And what he's saying here back to our passage in 1 John is if you don't like to do that, then chances are you are not one of us. He's saying if you don't love the brethren, you're probably not saved because one of the things that you love to do is be together because that's what God has done to your heart. That's what his love does to us. Right? And, and I'll tell you right now, if you don't like people in your lives and like doing life with, with the brothers and sisters in Christ, I guarantee you you're not in the right church because this, this is just one of those places where that's going to happen. I mean, it just, yeah, praise the Lord. So, we looked at what, love, what God's love did for us. It reconciled us back to God. We look at what, love, what God's love does for us. It changes our heart. We're going to look at our last point. What does love ask of you? What does love ask of you? And we kind of touched on it on this point, but I'm going to finish it up, finish up the chapter, starting in verse 19. He says, We will know by this, we will know, we'll know what? 
will know that we're his. That's what he's saying. So I know I chopped up this passage, so I need to want to connect it back to the point earlier. He says, we will know by this. We'll know what by this? We'll know that we're his by what? That we are of the truth. How will we know by, that we're of the truth? By our love for each other. And all of that, what he, the point he made in the first 18 verses, he's saying, by this, you will know your, you'll, you'll know your Jesus Christ. You'll know you're saved by your love for each other. And look at the result it has. And in this, all of that will assure you, or will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And then John doesn't leave us hanging there like, oh, what is that? Like, what, what, I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want to be condemned before God. I don't want my heart to feel convicted before God. I want to do what's pleasing to him because he's changed my heart. So John, help me out. What is it? Well, it's good that he simply defines it right here. Verse 23, this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. So he's not making it a secret. He's saying, here's what you do. Here's how you live pleasing to God. You believe in Jesus Christ, and you love your brothers and sisters. Okay. Here's an ex there's an example. As I was thinking about, what is an example in Scripture of, just, of this all-in kind of love, of this sold-out, nothing-held-back kind of love? And there's lots of them in Scripture, but one that just sort of struck me as being a little different, so I thought I'd share it. It's just going to come up on the screen. It's out of Luke 21, and it's about the widow who gives all that she has. So read along with me as it comes up on the screen. It says, And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two pieces, two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I say to you this, the poor widow put in more than all of them. For they, they all out of their surplus put in the offering. But she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Well, wait a minute. How is that a, a picture of... of, of just, just this complete, extravagant, overwhelming love. Because all she had was God. And he was enough. So everything else that she owned in the world, these two copper coins, she said, I'm all in. Now this isn't a parable. I mean, this, he, you, could, you could turn this into a parable about money and giving it. I, this demonstrates this woman's... Have you ever asked yourself the question, Why? Why did she go all in? Because she knew that God had gone all in for her. Right? She, all she had in the world was her relationship with God, and she was ready to give her whole life all she had back to him. And that's all she had. That's what he says. She gave all she had to live on. Guys, what, what does it ask of you? What does God's love ask of us? It asks, it asks everything. It asks us to go all in, right? Because, because God went all in for us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And everything came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that is, that is in being. And then it says, and this, I'm, I'm just quoting out of John 1, and then it says, And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then what does he say in verse 14? That light, that life that is Jesus Christ that was with Word in the beginning, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we beheld the glory of the Father, the one full of grace and truth. That's what we're celebrating. That's the first advent. That's what love looks like. Jesus Christ went all in for us. Not just, he's saying, oh, yeah, of course he does. We talk about the cross here a lot. That's all in. But guys, before the cross, Jesus Christ, the word, up in, with the Trinity, he says, Dad, I'll, I, I'll, I will empty myself of some of my glory. I will empty myself of some of my, of the, of, I will walk away from my place of honor at the right hand of my Father, and I will go down there and I'll live with these sinners in this filth. Because it's the only way we're ever going to be able to pay him back, pay, get the, pay, the price paid to get him back here. And he does it. That's what love looks like. Even if he hadn't gone to the cross. That would be like saying, whatever house you live in is better than... That would be like saying, you know what, I'm going to give up all of this and go live in a cardboard box under a bridge. 
Take that and multiply it by infinity. That's what Jesus Christ lived, gave up. And then, oh, by the way, he did it knowing that John 3.16 was going to happen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus knew before he came here, guys, what was in store for him. And he went all in. That's why God's love is radical. That's why his call, its call on our life is a radical, all-in for God call. Jesus Christ and being a Christian is not some other segment of my life that I just stick on to me and go, I'm good. It is an all-consuming life. That's what we want to be about. Guys, as we see his second advent coming, as we see the day drawing near, we want to be all, you don't want to be sitting there going, man, I was holding some back. You know, I, I still had a couple chips in my pocket, just in case. You want to be all in. It costs something to love radically. On the back of your little love handout, there's this saying, and I'm going to read it. We're part of it, just to kind of give you some ideas of what love looks like, what Christian love looks like. These are just some ideas that God hit me with as I was preparing for the message. And it's ultimately all for one purpose, and that's to bring glory to God. It says, The world says love is, wilf is the willful and maybe even joyful sacrifice of ourselves in the service of others so that we might be blessed. See, there's the difference. Like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, the world would say love your wife so that she'll do nice things for you. On the other hand, Christians understand love in a completely different way. Our love is a gospel-calibrated love. Christian love says, I am highly favored of God, richly blessed by the Lord, graced of God, deeply loved by the Father. There, just like Mary, just like Chloe read so well about Mary. Greetings, you who are highly favored. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that greeting has been given to you. You are, greetings, gr the one graced of God. That's us. Now get this. The world says love for the purpose of self, but the gospel sa says love at the expense of self. The world says, what can I gain from you? The gospel says, what can I give to you? The world says, what can you do for me? The gospel says, what can I do for you? That's something that needs to come out of my mouth a lot more. Those words right there, what can I do for you, needs to come out of my mouth a lot more. The world pursues love for the fulfillment of self and is left empty. Christians pursue love at the expense of self and are made full. Guys, we'll close with this. We're going to go into communion. If if God loved us so much that Jesus Christ was willing to come here, empty himself, come here and then die a death on a cross, and, and give us the opportunity for peace, that first advent, can we trust that he's coming back again to create perfect peace in the second advent? Absolutely we can. And here's what it's going to look like. So get this. As we close our time, just, just think about this reality that's coming soon. Here's the next angelic announcement that's going to happen. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the, on the cloud, or they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Guys, that is... Just like Gabriel came to Mary and said, greeting you who is highly favored. Right? That's what it's going to look like the next time. They're going to come back in glory and they're going to gather all of the elect, all the redeemed back to him. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 As we go into communion, guys, remember that. As we go into communion, if, if you don't know the peace of God, if you've never experienced that peace of God because your heart is still this cold, dark lump of coal, and maybe you think, you know, I'm a pretty good person. I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm better than that guy. The truth is, you're not changed. 
Because that very thought of at least I'm doing better than them, so I'm hopefully in, demonstrates that we don't understand the grace of God. The all-consuming grace of God. So I would ask you, this is a time as we come to communion, this is a time where we as believers in Christ come and we recognize who we are in Him and what He's done in our hearts. And that He has brought even the ability for us to partake of peace and love. And and if that describes you and you do know you're His and you do know you've partaken and you do know that your heart has changed, when you come to His table today, celebrate the reality that He's coming back And he's going to bring perfect peace. Everything we see on the news, everything we feel in our broken bodies that are hurting, it's all gone. It will all be gone in the twinkling of an eye. That's what he's promised. In John chapter 14, Jesus says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. I would not have told you so if it were not true, but I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, will I not come back? That's what he's going to do. He is going to come back and take us back to the place he's prepared. So as you come to his table today, ask yourself, ask yourself the question, two questions. One, are you prepared? Are you prepared? Do you know the peace of God? And the second thing is, are you prepared to live in that perfect peace? Are you, ex- are you living expectantly? Are you living in the radical love of our Lord? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the truth that we love you because you first loved us. Lord, I thank you for the truth that we have victory in Jesus Christ because of what you did on a cross. Lord, I, th- I thank you that you were willing to empty yourself of some of your glory, that you were willing to step away from your place of honor so that you could pay the price, the ransom. That's what we celebrate when we come to communion. We take um, the bread and we dip it in the juice and we celebrate the fact that we have victory that is found there. Everlasting peace is coming. Lord, may we cling to that truth even as we keep looking up, waiting for your return. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.